Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about finding limits. We often need to find the precise value that a limit will produce. However, the methods we saw when we first introduced limits, that is graphing it or a table of values for the function, they're not precise. They can give us a good idea of what the limit will be, but they don't give us certainty. They don't let us know that it will be exactly something. Likewise, the formal epsilon delta definition of a limit that we talked about in the last lesson, and it is totally fine if you do not know it. That was a completely optional lesson, only if you're really interested in math and want to find out more about stuff that's going to come down the road in a few years if you keep studying math. Totally fine if you didn't do it. But if you did, that's still not really going to help us find limits. It allows us to formally prove ironclad that this limit has to be here, and it's the deeper mechanics of what's going on under the hood for how a limit works. But it doesn't let us find limits. It doesn't make finding them easier. It's just about proving limits. In this lesson, we will see various methods to find the precise value. So that's what this lesson will be about. The basic idea that we're going to see with all these methods is to transform the function into something that works pretty much the exact same way, that we will just be able to plug in a value for the x in this equivalent version, and we'll be able to churn, you know, churn out some value for what the limit will come out to be. Now, before you watch this, make sure that you're already familiar with the concept of a limit. You really want to have a good understanding of how a limit works. We'll be working out how to get numbers in this lesson, but if you don't actually understand what this stuff means, it's all going to fall apart really quickly. So it's really important that you understand how a limit works before you watch this. If you don't already have a good understanding of how limits work, check out the uh, lesson two lessons back, Idea of a Limit, where we'll explain and get an idea of what is a limit about, and that way we'll have some meaning for what we are able, how we actually get precise values. You can figure out the precise values without really understanding what's going on, but that'll fall apart really, really quickly, and you might as well just have a nice foundation to work from there. Won't take that long to get an idea of what's going on. All right. First off, the easiest limits to find are limits for normal functions. And now that's in quotes because normal is not a technical term. What I just mean here is it's supposed to mean the kind of functions that we're used to dealing with, the sort of stuff that we use most often. Functions where it does not break, the function does not break at the point we're interested in. That is to say, the function is defined and makes sense. It doesn't suddenly break down when we get to the place we really care about. And it's not piecewise and or the point we're interested in is not at the very edge of the domain. So the point that we care about, whatever x we are going, we're going to some x going to c, right? Whatever c we're going towards, um, it's not going to be at the very edge of the domain or where we split on some piecewise function. So as long as that location makes sense, everything in that area makes sense, we know how to use the function in that area around that place, and it isn't piecewise, there aren't different parts of it, and it's not the very edge of the domain, the very starting or very last value for it, as long as those aren't the case, we'll be able to do it really easily. If these two conditions are met, where it isn't breaking down, and it's not piecewise, and the point isn't at the edge of the domain, then it's really easy to figure out what the value is going to be. So the point we're interested in, if the point we're interested in is the value that x approaches in the limit, that is to say x goes to c, and c is the place where things aren't breaking down, and c is not at a piecewise breakover, and it's not at the very edge of the domain, then it's almost always going to be the case that the limit as x goes to c of f of x is as simple as just plugging c in for x and getting f of c. So let's get an example first to see how we could use this. If we looked at the limit as x goes to 2 of 1 over x squared, what would that wind up being? Well, first notice, while 1 over x squared breaks down, it isn't defined, that is to say, at x equals 0, that's here. But we don't care about x equals 0. That's not the area that we're interested in. We care about x going to 2. So if x is going to 2, if we look in that area over here, well, that region, that's totally fine. It makes perfect sense. 1 over x squared works fine in the region over around x going to 2, right? As x goes to 2, well, all this stuff, it makes sense. We can see it. It clearly just maps to values. It's perfectly reasonable. Second, 1 over x squared is not a piecewise function. Don't have to worry about that. And x equals 2 is not at the edge of the domain. And the domain for 1 over x squared is every x with the exception of x equaling 0. It's all x not equal to 0. So we're not at the edge of a domain. It's not piecewise. And it makes sense in the area we're looking for, right? It makes total sense in here. So since it does all those, it means that we can just plug in the value that we're going to. Because of these two conditions, limit is x goes to 2, we just plug it in for x, and we have 1 over 2 squared, which simplifies to 1 over 4, and there's our limit. 
Why can we do this? What is the reason that we can get away with doing this? Well, in general, most of the functions we're used to working with don't do anything weird. They aren't strange in any way. And what I mean by weird is they're defined everywhere. I mean, not being weird, is that they're defined everywhere. They don't have holes. They don't jump around. So they're defined anywhere we might be interested in looking. They don't have any holes in it, and they don't jump around. So they work in a pretty reasonable way. They work normally. They're not weird. What this all means is that the functions we're used to working with, the functions that we normally work with, go where we expect them to go. Since a limit is about figuring out where a function is headed, a limit is about what is our expectation for this function, and a normal function has our expectations fulfilled, what the function, what we expect from the function is what we get out of the function, that means that we can evaluate normal functions at the location the limit approaches, right? Our expectation, the limit as x goes to c of f of x, what we expect to wind up landing, our journey, what we expect as we come in, winds up being what it actually is, what it is at the location. So we wind up, if it is normal, if f of x isn't doing something weird, then what we expect winds up being what we actually get. So the limit as x goes to c, well, we can just plug that in for f of x, and we have f of c will wind up being the limit anytime we're dealing with a normal function. In fact, this is true even if f of x does have weird stuff, but as long as it happens somewhere else. All we care about is x going to c. So as long as the neighborhood around x going to c is normal and the weird stuff happens off somewhere else, it isn't happening directly on top of that c, then the weird stuff, we don't care about it because the region we care about being normal is the region around x equals c. As long as the neighborhood around x equals c is normal, as long as around x equals c does this, then we will wind up being able to just plug into that just fine. So if there's weird stuff, that can be okay as long as it's far enough away. Like when we looked at 1 over x squared, there was weird stuff at x equals 0, but we didn't care about x equals 0. We cared about x going to 2. So as long as the weird stuff isn't right on top of where we're going to, we can just plug in our c, and that will tell us what the limit will come out to be if it's this fairly normal function that we've been working with for years and years. Of course, sometimes x goes to c, but something weird does happen at x going to c. When we are at x equals c, it is a weird place. So one weird thing that often happens is dividing by 0, right? You're not defined when you divide by 0. So consider the function and limit below, f of x equals 2x over x. Well, we can see it graphed here. It makes perfect sense up until we try to plug in x equals 0, at which point the function breaks down. But the limit, it's pretty clear. It's going to 2 the entire time. So what is it headed towards? It's headed towards 2. That's what we get out of the limit. So, of course, we can clearly see that the limit in this case, it exists, and it's 2. However, let's also notice that with the exception of x equals 0, so everywhere other than actually at x equals 0, where the weird things happen. The weird thing happens, the function f of x equals 2x over x is just equivalent to if we'd cancel out those x's and got g of x equals 2. Notice, f of x equals 2x over x, and g of x equals 2, these two functions are identical with the exception at x equals 0. So everywhere other than x equals 0, these two guys are totally the same. f of x equals 2x over x, g of x equals 2. They behave exactly the same with an exception at x equals 0. However, since we're looking at the limit as x goes to 0, we don't care about x equals 0, right? It's about the journey, not the destination. So if it's x to 0, the destination we don't care about is at x equals 0. So the weird thing here at x equals 0, we might as well forget about it. That means since we can use, since we don't care about what happens at the weird place, g of x equals 2 is exactly the same everywhere but the weird place, which means that we can use g of x to evaluate the limit when we can just plug in g of 0 to get 2. So g of 0, sorry, g in general, works just the same as f, right? g is just the same as f. It works the same everywhere with the exception of this one weird little point. However, since we're looking at a limit going to that one weird little point, we don't actually care about the weird little point. A single point doesn't matter because the limit's about the journey towards that point. So g of x equals 2 behaves the exact same for the journey portion, right? The journey towards behaves the exact same whether we're using f or whether we're using g, which means that g of x is what we can use for figuring out the limit. 
And then by the same logic we were just talking about previously, since g of x is totally normal at 2, we can just plug in there and we can get the answer from g of x. Now, how did we find, how did we find g of x? By canceling common factors. This logic works in general. If we have some function given as a fraction, we can cancel out factors between top and bottom. Because a single point, if we cancel a factor, the only thing that could possibly happen that would be bad is we'd cause one point to change around, right? Like with f of x, x equals 0 did not exist, but with g of x, x equals 0 did exist. So we caused a problem for specifically one point. But a single point has no effect on a limit. A single point has no effect when we're talking about a limit. Because with a limit, it's about the journey, not a single point that is our destination. So since a journey is made up of a multitude of points, taking out a single point, changing a single point, doesn't actually have an effect on where we wind up landing for our limit. So that means anytime we have common factors for a limit, we can cancel out common factors and just get what it would be without those common factors for the limit. We will have changed the functions that we're using, but the limits will be equivalent. So here's an example. We've got limit as x goes to 3 of x minus 3 times x plus 2 over x minus 3. Well, that means if we were to plug x equals 3 into this, we'd have 0 over 0, right? 3 minus 3 turns to 0. 3 minus 3 on the bottom turns to 0. So we get 0 over 0, so we can't do that, right? It freaks out. It's weird there. But we can cancel out x minus 3, cancel out x minus 3, just like we cancel out the k's here, and we get some other something over something, right? We get what remained, a and b. So in this case, we have x plus 2 divided by 1 now. So now it's the limit as x goes to 3 of x plus 2 is effectively going to work the same. x plus 2 is pretty much equivalent to x minus 3 times x plus 2 over x minus 3, with the exception of x equals 3. But since we don't care about that, since that's where we're headed towards, we can wind up using that limit instead. So we now plug in x going to 3 into x plus 2. Well, x plus 2, perfectly normal at x equals 3. Nothing weird happens there. So since nothing weird happens there, it works normally. We can just plug our value in there. We plug in 3, 3 plus 2, we get 5. Our answer is 5 for the limit. A similar idea to canceling out factors is rationalization rationalizing a portion of some fraction. If we have a radical that's in our way and it's part of a fraction, we can change it into a non-radical by multiplying the numerator and denominator by the same thing. What do we get rid of a uh, radical with? How do we rationalize an expression? We rationalize an expression that contains a radical by multiplying by its conjugate. That's the same expression, but now with a negative on one side. So for example, if we have root x plus 2, well, that's a radical and some non radical thing. If we go through the conjugate process, we get root x minus 2, plus switches to negative. If we have square root of x squared minus 3x minus 47x, so some radical minus something that's not in a radical, then its conjugate is root x squared minus 3x plus 47x. So notice, plus, if we're going through a conjugate, becomes minus, and minus becomes plus. So we just swap the sign on one of the portions, and that's how we get the conjugate. Now, if we multiply a radical expression by its conjugate, we'll wind up canceling out the radicals. And we'll see how that works in just a moment. Since multiplying a fraction on the top and bottom by the same thing gives an equivalent expression, right? If I've got a fraction, I can multiply it by 5 over 5, because 5 over 5 is just the same thing as 1, so it's still equivalent. We can figure out limits by doing this thing. And we can trust that this works, that this doesn't introduce any issues by the exact same logic we use to cancel out factors, right? If we were to multiply by something over something, it could, could introduce one slight issue, but it would only introduce a slight change to the function at one point. But because it's a limit, we don't care about single points on their own. We only care about continuums of points. So that single point being changed, eh, it's not really an issue. The limit will still work the same. So if we have the limit as x plus 4 minus, sorry, square root of x plus 4 minus 2 over x as x goes to 0, well, we would want to multiply this by the conjugate square root of x plus 4, but it was a minus previously, so now it swaps to a plus 2, and it will have to be divided by the same thing because we can only multiply by 1 effectively, which means same thing on top and bottom plus 2. We multiply by that and we will start working things out. What do we get out of that? Well, limit as x goes to 0 of square root of x plus 4 minus 2 over x times square root of x plus 4 plus 2 over square root of x plus 4 plus 2. Well, the top here is now going to become x plus 4 minus 4. And if we're not quite sure how we see that, let's look at root x plus 4 minus 2 times root x plus 4 minus 2. Well, what is, whoops, shouldn't have put that radical over the whole thing. 
radical ends there. What's root x plus 4 times root x plus 4? Well, square root of thing times square root of same thing always just lets out the thing on its own. Square root of smiley face times square root of smiley face becomes smiley face. So square root of x plus 4 times square root of x plus 4 becomes x plus 4. So x plus 4 is what we get out of that. And now we have square root of x plus 4 times negative 2. Oh, whoops, that shouldn't be negative 2. It should be plus because it is a conjugate. Sorry about that. So square root of x plus 4 times positive 2 is 2 root x plus 4. And then minus 2 times root x plus 4 is minus 2 root x plus 4. So we've got positive 2 root x plus 4, uh, minus 2 root x plus 4. Those two things, they cancel each other out, right? Positive 2, negative 2, they cancel each other out. So the middle part disappears. And now it's minus 2 times positive 2. Well, that becomes minus 2. Four. So that's where we get x plus 4 minus 4. On the bottom, it's x times this thing over here. So we just put it into quantity because we'll have some convenient canceling happening very soon. On our top, we have x plus 4 minus 4. So plus 4 minus 4, they cancel each other out. We're left with just x on top. Still x times square root of x plus 4 plus 2 on the bottom. But now I say, hey, we've got x on top, x on bottom. And now I've got the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over the square root of x plus 4 plus 2. At this point, we say, hey, if we plug in 0, does anything weird happen? Well, 1 over square root of 0 plus 4 plus 2. We aren't dividing by 0 anymore, so it effectively works as a normal function. We don't have any weird thing happening, so we plug in for our x at this point. So square root of 0 plus 4 plus 2 is in our denominator. 1 over square root of 4 is 2, so we've got 1 over 2 plus 2, which gets us 1 over 4. And that's how we get to our answer for that limit. We'll discuss evaluating the limits of piecewise functions. So we haven't talked about piecewise functions yet because we'll be talking about that in the next lesson, continuity and one-sided limits. We'll want a couple little new ideas before we talk about piecewise functions, so that's why we're saving them for the next lesson. For now, though, remember, as long as you're not trying to evaluate, so as long as it's not trying to evaluate the limit at some piecewise breakover, where it switches from one piece to another piece, the function's probably going to be behaving normally on the pieces that contain the point you care about, right? It might have a piecewise here and a piecewise here, and then it suddenly switches over. But as long as we're over here in the normal area, or we're over here in the normal area, nothing weird happens, right? So if it's not at a breakover point, then that means that since it's behaving normally, you can approach it the same way as you do behaving as just dealing with a limit of a normal function. Just plug in the appropriate value and see what comes out. Plug in the value that you're going towards and see what comes out. However, if you do need to evaluate a breakover point where you have to be talking about where it's switching from one to the next, check out the next lesson because we'll see how that idea works specifically in the next lesson. All right. Ready for some examples. First one, evaluate the limit as x goes to 2 of x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 4x minus 10. Our first question that we want to ask ourselves is, is it normal? x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 4x minus 10? Yeah, there's nothing weird that happens in that, right? That's just a polynomial. We're used to that sort of thing. So it is normal. Yay! If it's normal, then that means we can just plug in our value for each of the x. So we plug in our 2 because we know that the limit as what it gets is, well, 10, we don't have to plug x into 10. We know that the limit as what we're going to get out of this is the same thing as just what the function would be there, right? What we expect is what we get when we're dealing with a normal function. So we plug in 2. We've now got 2 to the 4th minus 3 times 2 squared plus 4 times 2 minus 10. 2 to the 4th is 16 minus 3 times 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. 3 times 4 is 12. Plus 4 times 2 is 8. Minus 10. 16 plus 8 gets us 24. Minus 12 minus 10 gets us minus 22. We put those together and we now have 2. Done. Next one. Let f of x equal x squared minus 3 when x is less than or equal to 2 and 5x plus 2 when x is greater than 2. So first let's just see really quickly what this looks like. So here's a rough picture of what it looks like. So x squared minus 3, I'll do that with blue here. So x squared minus 3, that's basically like a parabola. It's just been lowered by 3, normal standard parabola. And it goes until x is less than or equal to 2, at which point it stops here at 2. And then after that, we're at x greater than 2. So we switch over to 5x plus 2 when x is greater than 2. So it starts here, and then it goes off like this. And that's what you wind up seeing. So the question here is, if we're going to evaluate the limit, the limit as x goes to 1 of f over x, oh no, it's a piecewise function, right? Well, yeah, but we're clearly contained within x less than or equal to 2, right? The area we care about is this area here. That's far enough from something weird happening, right? Something weird does wind up happening over a little bit further to the right, 
but we don't care about that because in the neighborhood we're interested in, that's x going to 1, we are smack dab definitely less than or equal to 2 if we're close enough to 1. So since being close enough to 1 means nothing weird happens, all we're dealing with is x squared minus 3. So we're effectively normal because we only have to consider the part of the piecewise function that we are inside of. So the part of the piecewise function that we're inside of is x squared minus 3. So we can just plug our 1 into x squared minus 3. So x squared minus 3, we plug in our 1. 1 squared minus 3. 1 minus 3 gets us negative 2. And there's our limit. Next example, evaluate the limit as x goes to negative 3 of x squared plus 3x over x squared minus 9. So our first question is, is it normal? Well, if we plug in negative 3, what do we get on the top? Well, we'll get 9 minus 9, so that's 0. And then on the bottom, we'll get x squared minus 9, so that'll be positive 9 minus 9. Oh, we get 0 over 0. So that means it is not normal. Ah, oh no. But what do we do as soon as we go not normal? We start thinking, all right, well, what else is in our bag of tricks? We've got the possibility of canceling factors. So what we want to do now is we want to think, is there a way for us to cancel out factors? Can we cancel out factors? Well, we've got x squared plus 3x, so I'll write limit as x goes to negative 3. Technically, we really should have the limit at every step. If you wind up really not feeling like writing out the whole thing, at least write limit so we know that we're still dealing with a limit and we'll plug in something later. x squared plus 3x over x squared minus 9, so x squared plus 3x over x squared minus 9. Well, limit as x goes to negative 3, well, how can we change the top? How can we factor the top? Well, we could pull out an x, and we'd have x times x plus 3 on top. How can we factor the bottom? x squared minus 9. Oh, that's just the same thing as x plus 3 times x minus 3. Hey, great. We can cancel factors. So we cancel x plus 3, cancel x plus 3. And that's fine, because we're just working with a limit. So our limit is now the same thing as x goes to negative 3 of x on top divided by x minus 3 on the bottom. Now we ask ourselves, if we plug in negative 3, does anything weird and disastrous happen? Negative 3 on top, negative 3 on the bottom. We don't get 0 over 0. We don't even get dividing by 0 once. We're totally fine. So we plug in, because now it's effectively a normal function, since something weird isn't happening. So we have negative 3 over negative 3 minus 3. That gets us negative 3 over negative 6. Negative 3 over negative 6, the negatives cancel. 3 over 6, 1 half, and so we get 1 half as the answer to our limit. Great. Next one, evaluate the limit as x goes to 0 of tan x over sine x. First question we ask ourselves are, is are we normal? Is this normal? Well, if we plug in 0, tan of 0 is 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Ooh, that means we're 0 over 0, so it is not normal. But if it's not normal, the first thing we reach into in our bag of tricks is we ask ourselves, can we cancel factors? So if we can cancel factors, we're good. So how can we cancel factors? Limit as x goes to 0. So limit as x goes to 0. How can we change tan of x? Well, tan x, remember, that's just the same thing as sine x over cosine x. And anytime we don't have just sine and cosine and we're dealing with trig stuff, it normally helps to put in just in terms of sine and cosine. So we have sine x over cosine x all divided by sine x. Oh, OK. Well, oh, now we see we can start canceling stuff. So limit as x goes to 0. Well, we could rewrite this as sine x over cosine x. We could just cancel out the sine x if we see that directly. But if we find it difficult to divide, to have fractions and fractions, we could think of this as divided by sine x, which means that that's the same thing as limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over cosine x times 1 over sine x, right? If you divide, it flips to a fraction, which we could have also done by just breaking out the fraction of the sine x on the bottom to the side. So now we say, hey, sine x on the bottom, sine x on the top. Woo, we cancel some stuff out. Limit as x goes to 0. Now we've got 1 over cosine of x. Since we managed to cancel some stuff out, let's ask ourselves, if we plug in 0, is it weird? Is it normal? What happens? Well, x goes into 0 for cosine of x. Cosine of 0 is 1. Hey, 1 over 1, totally not weird anymore. So that means we can now swap in our 0. 1 over cosine of 0. 1 over cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. We've got 1 over 1, so our limit comes out to be 1. Yay! OK, next one, evaluate the limit as x goes to 4 of 2 minus root x over 4 minus x. First thing we ask ourselves is, is it normal? Well, if we plug in 4 on the top, we'll get 2 minus square root of 4. So that'll come out to be 0. Divide by 4 minus 4, ooh, even worse, divide by 0. Yeah, so 0 over 0, not normal. Ah, 
not, not normal. No, no. So not normal. So next thing we ask ourselves is can we cancel factors? Well, 2 minus root x, 4 minus x, we might be able to figure out a way to cancel factors, but not easy. So canceling factors, canceling factors, eh, we might be able to figure out a way. We could figure out a way, but let's say we don't want to figure out cancel factors. Bleh. Cancel factors, not easy. So, oh, hey, there's a radical. What was the trick we learned for dealing with radicals? We rationalize. So we move on to the next trick in our bag of tricks is we rationalize. So we rationalize. What do we do? We've got limit as x goes to 4 of 2 minus the square root of x over 4 minus x. So how do we rationalize? We multiply by the conjugate on the top and the bottom. 2 minus root x, its conjugate is 2 plus root x. We could also put a negative on the 2, but it doesn't really matter where, which side gets the negative. 2 plus root x, 2 plus root x. Great. Multiply our tops together, multiply our bottoms together. 2 minus root x times 2 plus root x, right? We've got these are now factors with parentheses around them because we have to have distribution going on. So 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times root x is 2 root x. Minus root x times 2 is plus 2 root x and minus 2 root x. They cancel each other out. Minus root x times positive root x becomes minus x, right? Root x times root x always comes out to be x. Square root of smiley face times square root of smiley face always comes out to smiley face. Root root cancels the roots, as long as it's the same thing underneath it. 4 minus x times 2 plus root x. Well, we can multiply them together, but hey, 4 minus x is what we have on the top right now. We're basically working towards canceling out factors. So 2 plus root x, at this point, we are now going to be able to cancel out factors. So we've got the 4 minus x on the bottom, 4 minus x on the top. They cancel each other out, and now we've got the limit as x goes to 4 of 1 over 2 plus root x. Great. So if we were to plug 4 into this, would something weird happen? 1 over 2 plus root 4? No. We don't have 0 showing up. We aren't dividing by 0. It basically works like a normal function. It does work like a normal function. Nothing weird going on there. So that means we can just plug in our value. So 1 over 2 plus plugging in for 4 for our x. 1 over 2 plus 2, square root of 4 is 2, and 1 over 4 is our answer. Nice. Final example, evaluate the limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over x plus 3 minus 1 over 3, all divided by x. First question we ask ourselves is, is it a normal function? So is it normal? Well, yeah, you can guess by my hint of no. Uh, if we plugged in 0, 1 over 3 minus 1 over 3, 0 on top, divided by 0 on bottom. No, definitely not normal. So it is not normal. Ah, oh no, what are we going to do? Well, the next thing we ask ourselves is can we cancel factors? So can we cancel? Mm, not easily, right? 1 over x plus 3 minus 1 over 3. Really don't see any easy ways to make cancellation show up there, so probably not going to be able to cancel, at least not easily. So our next question is, last time we asked ourselves, can we rationalize? Well, there's no radicals here, so we can't rationalize, but we can take a hint from the idea of rationalization. The idea of rationalization was multiply the top and the bottom by something that makes some part not weird anymore, not as strange to deal with, so hopefully we can get cancellation to appear later. Well, what would make the top, the thing that's really strange about this is we've got fraction over fraction, right? We don't like fractions and fractions. So how could we get rid of some of those fractions by multiplying? Well, the easiest way to get rid of the denominator in the top is to just multiply by the denominators in the top, right? So if we multiply limit, so I'll rewrite the thing out, limit is x goes to 0 of 1 over x plus 3 minus 1 over 3 all over x. Well, what would get rid of the x plus 3? Well, x plus 3 would get rid of the denominator of x plus 3. What would get rid of 1 over 3? Well, multiplying by 3. So we can get rid of both of those denominators by multiplying that whole top by x plus 3 times 3. That'll cancel out each of the denominators as we work through it. And remember, it's always going to multiply the whole thing. When we multiply, we multiply the quantity because we have to have distribution showing up. And on the bottom, we'll have to have the same thing because otherwise we're not multiplying by, you know, we're changing the expression. We can't change the expression. x plus 3 times 3 over x plus 3 times 3. Great. Our limit continues. Limit as x goes to 0. What do we get on the top? Well, x plus 3 times 1 over x plus 3. Those cancel out. We're left with just the 3 left over, right? So x plus 3 times 3 on 1 over x plus 3. The x plus 3 cancel out. We're left with just 3 minus when 
x plus 3 times 3 can't hits 1 over 3. Well, the x plus 3 doesn't do anything, but the times 3, that cancels out, so we're left with minus quantity x plus 3. All right. Now, we could expand the bottom, but that won't actually help us, right? One of the ideas we're going to hopefully manage to get to is to figure out a way to cancel things. We couldn't cancel things easily by factoring, but hopefully we'll still manage to cancel something at some point later on. So we don't want to break, we don't want to expand factors. We want to actually keep up this process of keeping things in factors. So let's not put anything together. We'll have it as x times x plus 3 times 3. So at this point, we see x plus 3 on top and x plus 3 on the bottom, but we have to be careful. Don't cancel stuff, right? We can't cancel because there's still a subtraction sign on the top. We have to have the whole factor. So we keep working to simplify. Limit as x goes to 0. 3 minus quantity x plus 3. Well, the 3s will cancel out and we're left with just negative x on the top. Negative x on the top. Divide by x times x plus 3 times 3. Great. Limit as x goes to 0 of negative x over x times x plus 3 times 3. At this point, we go, hey, we can cancel some stuff. This x and this x cancel, and we're left over with the limit as x goes to 0 of negative 1 now, because it just canceled out the x, not also the negative, times x plus 3 times 3. Now, we ask ourselves, now that we've managed to cancel something, if we were to plug in a number, would we have something weird happen? Would it be normal now? If we plug in 0, we get negative 1 over 0 plus 3 times 3. Hey, doesn't look like we're going to be having dividing by 0 any issues anymore. It isn't weird anymore, so we can just plug in. So we have this is equal to the negative 1 over 0 plus 3 times 3. Once it's not weird, we can plug in because now it is effectively normal. And when it's effectively a normal function, you can just plug into it with your limit. Negative 1 over 3 times 3. So that gets us negative 1 over 9. And there's our answer. Great. All right, so at this point, we've got a really good understanding for how to figure out how limits work. The basic idea is, all right, I've got a limit that is normal and doesn't have anything weird happen. Easy. Just plug in something, crank it out, see what number you get out. That's what the limit is. Because normal means that your expectations will be met. If it's not normal, if there's something weird happen, you try to manipulate things. You either pull out factors, you multiply the top and the bottom, you do something where you're allowed to cancel factors later on, and then you check and see, okay, now that I've canceled out the factors, is it possible for to plug things in and have it be normal effectively. Can I now plug in now that there isn't hopefully a weird thing happening? Sometimes there will still be weird things happening. All the examples we saw here, we canceled out anything that would cause weird stuff to happen, but sometimes you wind up still having weird stuff no matter what you manage to cancel out. And in that case, it can help to check a graph and go, oh, I see, it's going to blow out to infinity, something like that, and you'll see, oh, it's never going to work. But a lot of the time you can cancel stuff out and you can go, oh, okay, now it's effectively behaving like a normal function, so I can plug in the x value that I'm going towards and just crank out an answer. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.